the British had a problem. They couldn't venture too far from their base at Fort Malden, or the Americans would take back Fort Detroit. And they were dependent on a long supply line, which was fed by ships on Lake Erie. The Americans were now building a fleet of their own ships, and Harrison left Fort Meigs to consult with the young Commodore of the naval fleet. So it was up to this new generation of, of young military officer, and the one that most, becomes most important, partially by his own grit and determination, and intelligence and partly by plain dumb luck was Oliver Hazard Perry. Full of manners, very intelligent, able to actually ship, build, and design. He really was a naval architect and an excellent military strategist. Perry is, of course, a member of one of the Navy's first families in the 19th century. And Oliver, as the oldest son, uh, tries to secure as much advancement as he possibly can. So he uh, uh, volunteered for service on the lake to be the, uh, the local commander for the squadron being built on Lake Erie. Erie was the best place on the eastern end of the lakes to build ships because it was a naturally protected harbor on three sides. Getting into Erie Harbor had a very narrow, widening channel entrance with a sandbar which had only six feet of water the Americans could easily defend the entrance to that harbor and keep the British out. The ships were almost complete, but Perry was having trouble recruiting sailors to man the new squadron. But in the end, he assembled a diverse crew that would serve him well. Perry did have some ex uh, excellent sailors, a small group, I'd say about 10, were really proficient uh, in what you call the nautical affairs. Others, they just grab, catch as catch can, and this included a number of African Americans who served in the War of 1812. We don't know exact numbers or names because the race wasn't recorded, but each captain was responsible for filling out his own crew, and uh, if his responsibility is to have a mission-capable ship, the obvious answer is to recruit whoever is qualified and willing to serve and just not tell the Secretary of the Navy who they are. The British uh, captain uh, does patrol outside the harbor, but because he has no ground troops, he can't attack it. He wants to keep the fleet inside Presque Isle Bay rather than let it out. While the British patrol under the command of Robert Harriet Barclay is absent, Perry's men start releasing the ships from the harbor. The gunboats and his flagship, the Lawrence, are now free. His other warship, the Niagara, is stuck on the sandbar. At that moment, the British return. Perry, is being the, the aggressive commander he is, heads straight for the British fleet. Now, Barclay's several miles away, and he's looking through you know, his, his spyglass, undoubtedly, and he says, uh-oh, the Lawrence is on the lake, the gunboats are coming, there sits the Niagara, I'm outnumbered. Barclay turns around and heads back. And if that's not luck, I don't know what is. Once the American ships are fitted out with guns and supplies, Perry sails for Put-in Bay Harbor, located on South Bass Island in Western Lake Erie. It was actually Harrison that selected Put-in Bay as Perry's base of operations. Two reasons, one, it is a sheltered area, but also it would give Perry a great view of the Detroit River. Perry could put a ship up in that area as a patrol vessel and spot the returning visit of British supply vessels and warships and very easily sail up there and stop them on their way back. So as long as Perry was sitting here at Putin Bay, the British supply line was severed. The situation is getting worse for the British. With Perry loose on the lake and Harrison mounting huge forces on land, they can't get the supplies they need to fight and the food they need for themselves and their Indian allies. Well, it got to a point up in Fort Malden where General Proctor came to uh, Robert Barclay and said, you have to go. I don't care if you're ready or not, you have to go. We're down to our last bits of flour. You must sail. What was driving them out was that the, uh, the Americans were blockading them from their source of supply. They'd been on half rations for a week. They had half rations for one more week. 
and then they were out. Uh, so uh, Perry had a lot of problems on his side too. Uh, he had had a lot of fever and dysentery running through his crew and about a third on sick list at any one time. So uh, both sides were fairly miserable uh, wanting to get this over with. The Battle of Lake Erie is the day the hungry came out to fight the sick. Barclay sailed out of Fort Malden and down the Detroit River. On September 10, 1813, a lookout for Perry spotted the British fleet on the lake. The British had six vessels under command of uh, Robert Harriet Barclay. The Americans had nine vessels under the command of uh, Oliver Hazard Perry. One critical factor against Perry at that point in time was the wind direction. He virtually needed the wind behind him to help him sail out to meet the British fleet. The British have what is called the weather gauge. The wind is in their favor. And Perry has to slowly but surely inch his way against the wind and to uh, weave his way towards the British. But about midday, the, the wind changes. And it's now Perry who has the weather gauge. So he decided to take an extreme risk and ordered a downwind turn to sail directly at the enemy to close the range, uh, very much as Nelson did at Trafalgar. He decided to endure raking fire and be able to outgun them once he got in close with his shorter range, heavier armament. The British band plays Rule Britannia, and immediately as the, the last echoes of that sound float across Western Lake Erie, 24 pound cannon opens fire towards the Americans. The first cannon missed, but the second cannon fired, crashed through the deck of the Lords. Perry turned and looked, and for whatever reason, the Niagara held back. It was not coming up to meet the other largest British ship. So Perry and his ship basically were being pummeled by the British fleet. All the British firepower was being turned onto the Lawrence. Sails were hanging in tattered strip. Rigging looks like tangled kite string hanging from a tree. Uh, bulwarks blasted like Swiss cheese. Deck seams had split apart a little bit and blood from the wounded are seeping down into the wardroom where the operating theater is down below. Perry, who is for some reason or another miraculously unwounded, over a hundred of his 120 man crew are wounded or dead. Uh, Perry moves from the Lawrence to the Niagara. He pulled down his, his battle flag, jumped into the little cutter, and sailed across that third of mile to the Niagara. All six British ships concentrated their fire on that little rowboat, and every man in it was soaked from the splash of near misses. But Perry's luck. Again, miraculously, he managed to reach the Niagara unscathed. Perry, as captain of a ship, had the right to have his own battle flag. The words on Perry's battle flag were, don't give up the ship. This phrase was inspired by Perry's good friend and mentor, Captain James Lawrence. Lawrence had directed his own men, don't give up the ship, before he died in battle earlier in the war. Perry not only named his ship the Lawrence, but he also adopted those words for his battle flag. Perry's transfer is one of the best known episodes in U.S. naval history. In the eventuality, the only way to win the battle was to give up the ship and go to the next one. The, the real motto was don't give up. Barclay had been wounded, and junior officers now commanded the two lead British warships, the Detroit and the Queen Charlotte. They ran into each other and became entangled. And so when Perry sails, uh, across their bows, he's able to rake down the entire length of both vessels and forces them to surrender rather quickly. This was the only time in the British naval history where they surrendered an entire fleet. Well, immediately upon the surrender of the British ships, Perry knew he had to notify his superior. So what he did is he uh, found an old envelope and he used his hat as a desk. And writing on the back of that old envelope, in pencil, he wrote, Dear General, we have met the enemy, and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop. Yours with great respect and esteem, O.H. Perry. So out of this engagement, two of the most famous sayings in American naval history come out of it. Don't give up the ship, 
which is now the official motto of the U.S. Navy. And then the other one is, um, we have met the enemy, you know, and they are ours, uh, which was the liberation call. It really, that line, when all, when it got reached Washington and the East Coast, it meant we could beat these guys. Soon after the battle, Perry transports Harrison's men across Lake Erie in stages, first to South Bass Island, then on to Canada. They land a few miles south of uh, Amherstburg, expecting British opposition. But the British instead have evacuated uh, Amherstburg, Fort Malden, uh, Windsor, and Detroit, and are beginning to march towards uh, the uh, Thames River Valley uh, in Western Ontario. Harry participated in the Thames campaign. He took what ships he could over the bar of the Thames River, sailed up to the head of navigation, borrowed a horse from somebody, and then served as a volunteer aide to Harrison. With Perry and Harrison in pursuit, the already strained alliance between the British and native forces is now at breaking point. Proctor wants to take everybody and move to the east and join up with the forces around Fort Niagara. Tecumseh wants to stay and fight and resist. Then the word comes of Harrison's army on the move. Tecumseh essentially accuses Proctor of being like a dog with his tail between his legs running away rather than fighting up as a man really should. At the River Thames, Proctor agrees to turn and fight Harrison's troops. The Indian forces are overpowered by the Americans, and the British troops retreat to the east.